Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of CNET Development Dialogues. I am Swati Prabhu and I am extremely delighted to have with us today Mr. Patrick Kugel. Mr. Kugel is an analyst in the Asia Pacific program at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. His research focuses on the countries of South Asia, mainly India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And he also works on the development cooperation policy of Poland and the European Union. He finished his MPhil in South Asian Studies from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, India. He has also studied international relations with a specialization in American studies and cultural studies, specializing in religious studies at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. Mr. Kugel is also the author of the book titled India Soft Power, a new foreign policy strategy published by Rutledge in 2017. A warm welcome to you, Patrick, today in our episode. Thank you very much for invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks a lot. So Patrick, since we are sitting right in the middle of a pandemic, you know, that seems to be spiraling beyond control. I want to start off the discussion today by talking about India's vaccine diplomacy, that is vaccine metry. It has been in the news for quite some time now, and it is also a visible element of India's development partnership. What is your perspective on India distributing vaccines all over the world when its own population ended up being severely hit by the virus as part of the second wave? Uh, well, I think it was a smart move and very good move by the, the Indian government to start supplying vaccines to other countries in the neighborhood, but also to, to all, many countries around the world. Uh, at, at the time when the vac uh, vaccine maitri started, we, no one could have expected what, what, what will happen next. So for the time being in, in February, in March, I even wrote in, a, a paper on India's vaccine diplomacy. And I was very much impressed. And I think it was a good move to boost the image of India present India as a, a modern country, uh, which is uh, to, 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 to promote the image of India as a pharmacy of the world. And as Prime Minister Modi has often uh, spoken that India is a force for good. So it, it really boosted the, the image of India internationally. But what happened next, uh, uh, obviously it changed everything. And today the, the image of India is in tatters uh, because of what happened to India and because this vaccine diplomacy uh, eventually failed because the, the, the demand in India was so huge that India didn't even supply what it subscribed to, what it, what it promised to do uh, within the uh, COVAX international uh, program. Uh, so, so uh, you know, looking from the hint side, uh, one can say that uh, it was a mistake, but I wouldn't blame anyone in the government for what what it did in, in the early year, yeah? because we had the new uh, mutation of the virus, uh, now called Delta, uh, and no one could have expected what will happen next. But for a for, for few months at least, India did, it, did its part as a responsible stakeholder and, and responsible power and uh, eventually also, I think the support that India got from international community when it was struck by the, by the crisis was also the outcome of its uh, very responsible and generous support to other countries during uh, in the early months of this, of this year. So, so uh, yeah, in, in total, yeah, today it, it, it seems that it was a mistake, but, but I don't, I don't think so. Yeah? India did its part uh, in February, in, in, in January also, it had, it had uh, stockpiles of vaccines that was, was not ready to be used in India uh, yet. So everything looked uh, just very good time and good moment to, to share its uh, vaccines with other developing countries. Yeah, but what ha happened next uh, changed the picture, but I would rather mm, like to see the, the glass half full rather than half empty. Right. So uh, when we talk about, you know, development partnerships, it 
it can be you know considered as a refined version of eight maybe giving eight i would like to bring in the european union here and its development policy and uh, it's a given that you know eu's development policy has to be viewed from this prism of a shared competence between the commission and the member states and uh, taking it to account this north versus the south schism you know india's development partnership on one hand and the eu's development partnership on the other and this entire aid dynamic do you think the european union's development cooperation policy carries the potential to balance this divide somehow between india and european union yeah like north versus the south you know where this whole debate of north versus the south aid divide uh yes absolutely development partnerships or development cooperation with one area uh, in which uh, you know both northern and southern countries are um, going uh, increasingly in the same direction the the gap between the two is narrowing uh, uh, with every year and this is also because very important changing changes are taking place in the european union the development cooperation of the european union is undergoing a profound uh, changes yeah, it's for example you know also it, it's visible in the name of the development cooperation commissioner in the european commission yeah because it, it used to be uh, named uh, development uh, assistance in the past then it was development cooperation and the current commissioner uh, uh, holds the position of uh, international partnerships uh, commissioner so it, it it carries also the the weight in the name also uh, and shows you the, the 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 evolution and direction of the evolution of the development cooperation in the european union we are going to spend more in the forms of loans and not so much on on grants as as used to be in the past uh we are i think the european union is also getting more uh, self interested in, in in giving aid yeah, in giving giving uh, development assistance uh, so it used to criticize countries like like india or china or other so called southern uh, countries Uh, for the 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 practice the the mode of development partnerships that they used to 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 carry but these days i i think the european union is going more in the direction of the southern uh, countries so this the division and the gap is uh, narrowing down uh, there are still differences also in in the terms of how we calculate yeah, how we uh, um, evaluate the development assistance uh what can we ter term and name development assistance or or, or what not uh, uh and uh, to which standards and and rules uh, do we subscribe and there is still a lot of differences but i think there is ongoing dialogue on development cooperation between the european union and india for for instance or the oecd uh, countries and uh, and india uh, so it 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 does uh, have a ha, have a potential to uh, to bring those partners together and and possibly to start some trilateral uh, cooperation projects also in third countries which is also very uh, huge uh, which carries huge potential for cooperation okay uh in the same breath you know when we're talking about eu's development cooperation policy uh i want to uh, bring in this aspect of agenda 2030 you know how would you evaluate eu's development policy progress on its sdg commitments between asia and africa which region do you think gains more spotlight for the union absolutely sustainable development goals uh is uh, some kind of common universal uh, global commitment that every country needs to implement uh, internally in its own country but also it can help others to to achieve sdgs if if only it has a uh, potential and and uh, capacity to do this so at the internal level i think most of european countries are on the way or they have already achieved sdgs so they are they are on the way to to, to improve them or achieve them you know on time but when we 
when we talk about the external dim dimension, how European Union is uh, supporting other countries in attaining the SDGs, uh, I, I think we can also be, be proud of what Europe is doing. Uh, you know, we have European countries uh, provide uh, assistance to third countries, both at bilateral level and through the uh, European uh, Union, so at the community level. And if you combine the, 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 the aid given by uh, individual member states and by the Commission, uh, then you will realize that European Union is still, even after the Brexit, is still the largest mm, donor of, of development assistance to, to other countries. So it's doing its, its, its uh, part, in, its share in, in helping others to, to achieve uh, SDGs. Uh, absolutely, I would love to, to see European Union doing uh, even more. Uh, we have uh, self-imposed uh, some commitments that we will you know, spend on ODA, official development assistance, uh, up to 0.7% of uh, GDP. And both of the countries are still far away from achieving this, this aim. Uh, so the, the the money is still uh, the problem. Uh, the the you know, individual member states uh, uh, attain the realize the commitments uh, in different uh, uh, manner to different extent. Uh, so th there is still uh, potential to 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 do more. But what we can see uh, during the pandemic, at least, or even before. Uh, that European Communion want European Union wants to uh, work as one uh, as one single uh, unit, and we have this concept of Team Europe. So we uh, European Union wants to coordinate and uh, organize the development assistance uh, in a better way. So uh, there is no duplication. So we uh, target uh, countries that are most in need. And, and so on. And when you talk about the, the, the directions of, of where European Union is more active and where it targets, targets its, uh, its money and its uh, efforts, then I, I think for, for many reasons, Africa is more important to, to Europe than, than Asia. Uh, first of all, because it is geographically uh, closer to us. It, yeah, we just shared the, the Mediterranean Sea uh, across the sea, there is this huge uh, African continent with, with many challenges from peace and security to development to, to SDGs to, uh, to, to, uh, to migration, yeah, which used to be a very important uh, point of concern for Europe for for last uh, several years. And secondly, also and very naturally, uh, Africa is still the continent where you can find the most least developed countries. So, so really the needs are the biggest in Africa. Uh, in Asia, the picture is more complicated. Yeah? It's more diverse uh, continent. We have countries doing very well. We have very rich countries also in, in Asia. We have just a few uh, less developed countries which needs uh, more assistance. And I think European Union is also uh, present there. It's present in, in South Asia. It's, uh, it's uh, providing assistance to, 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 to Nepal, to, to Pakistan, to Sri Lanka, to, to many other countries. And it's also supporting regional initi initiatives in, in Asia. Yeah? It, it, it's supporting also you know, individual countries in meeting uh, modern global challenges like climate change, yeah? how to to adapt to, to climate change, to how to mitigate the, the effects of, of climate change. So, uh, you know, we would need much more time to discuss this in details, but I think uh, that in, in coming years, uh, Europe will focus most on, on Africa and, and sub will support African countries in meeting SDGs, but it will not forget about Asia and it will be more focused, it will be more selective we will be also maybe more demanding. Yeah? It will expect uh, bigger commitments from uh, Asian or African countries to do reforms, to, to invest, uh, to, to fight corruption, and et cetera, et cetera. But 
the European Union will certainly uh, remain as the biggest player or main player in, in terms of uh, driving this global effort to attain SDGs. Uh, since you mentioned, Patrick, that uh, the EU's development cooperation policy has you know, set its eyes towards Africa, I want to bring in India's development partnerships here, particularly talking about the SDGs and Agenda 2030. Uh, do you feel it plays, what role it can play when it comes to the SDGs, particularly in South Asia, talking about the Asian side here and India's development partnership? In, in your view, how far do you think India has, you know, been able to achieve or fulfill the SDG targets in the developing countries in South Asia? I think India has a huge role to play. In South Asia, it's a natural uh, neighborhood and natural uh, arena for India to be present. It used to be for, for many years. Yeah? Uh, you, India used to spend around half of its uh, aid to uh, support neighboring countries in South Asia. Uh, so it does play a huge role in countries like Nepal or Bhutan. Uh, so it, it is a player. It, it's a major player. It has enormous expertise. It has contacts. It has uh, also um, competitive advantages like the lower costs of, of work. Yeah. So, so I think also India uh, has a lot to offer to third countries, to development partners like uh, United States or like the European Union. So we can, you know, divide the, the, the work between us and together we can do more in, in South Asia, for example. Yeah? India knows the region very well. Uh, it has been present there for many years. Europe is doing uh, aid in on, on its own way. And if the two can combine the efforts, uh, uh, it will bring only positive effects for, for, for both India and the European Union, but also for every country in, the, in, the, uh, in South Asia. Uh, what I would only love to see when we talk about India's role in, in South Asia, I would, I would expect uh, and would, would like to see India playing bigger role in Pakistan. And this is one, one, one area, you know, I, I wrote this book on India's soft power, you, you mentioned. And development partnership is powerful tool for India to boost its image, to boost it, its attractiveness, uh, to, to win friends, yeah? to, to, to uh, encourage others to follow its footsteps. Uh, so development partnerships is doing a lot of good uh, goodwill for India. It's enough to look at Afghanistan, yeah? how, how much India did for Afghan, Afghanistan and for Afghans and how much goodwill it created. So, so uh, uh, India is doing a lot in, 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 in the terms of, of its soft power and its development partnerships, but from my perspective, what is missing in this approach to South Asia is the, the Pakistan, yeah? the, the omission of, of Pakistan. Yeah? So, so soft, soft power is not exercised towards this difficult neighbor for India. I understand for, for many reasons why it, why it is, but uh, I think in the long term, it's better to win friends uh, uh, by supporting other countries rather than fight, than fight enemies. Right. Uh, Patrick, these days our discussion on development you know, is incomplete without talking about the Indo-Pacific. And uh, the EU finally came out with a strategy on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, how do you view this strategy shaping the debate on multilateralism? And uh, do you feel this strategy could provide a leverage towards partnering with India on development in this key region? Oh, this is very important. Yeah, I understand Indo-Pacific concept has been very important for India in India for many years, and we in Europe just started adjusting, uh, you know, our uh, uh, worldview recently. And as you mentioned in in April, I I think the European Commission came out with this uh, European Council, Council came out with the conclusion. So one explanation maybe is that it, it hasn't been the strategy on Indo-Pacific yet. It was only a kind of guidance and the, the, the Indo-Pacific strategy 
is in the pipeline. Yeah, it's, uh, it's expected to be published next month in, in, in September. So we will learn more what Europe is going to do in the Indo-Pacific, how it sees itself, its role in, in this vast region, uh, geopolitical region, uh, and how, how it sees India, how it see, sees uh, China and other key players in, in, in the region. What we know from the document uh, published in April uh, is that that, in, that Europe wants to see Indo-Pacific as an area of cooperation rather than comp competition. Yeah? I, I think it, and it can be uh, added value of Europe uh, to bring uh, this kind of uh, experience of you know coordinating cooperation between 28 or 27 member states. Uh, European Union is uh, very good in, in, in multilateralism. It's, it uh, sees itself at least as a, a leader in multilateralism. Uh, so it, it, I, I hope it will uh, you know, bring, bring more cooperation and multilateralism towards Indo-Pacific. I'm not sure whether this is what India expects and would like to see, uh, taking into account it's kind of difficult relations with China and uh, you know, growing cooperation within the Quad, with the United States and, and other countries. Uh, but what we have learned from Prime Minister Modi in recent years was also that, that the view that, that India wants Indo-Pacific to be inclusive, to be uh, based on cooperation rather than competition. So I think there is there is a huge, uh, a, a lot of uh, potential for cooperation. Uh, the, 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 there's shared view on Indo-Pacific between European Union and, and India. And I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, European Union is not a security player also. Uh, at, at least not the major one in the in the Pacific, but we are yeah, as a European Union, we are certainly the major economic player, major uh, provider of development assistance, also uh, leader in technology, in, in multilateralism, etc. etc. So, so I think we can bring all of that to the table, and and we will find a lot of areas on, of cooperation with India be it trilateral projects in, in other countries in, in, in the Pacific, or maybe we can discuss some kind of uh, mechanism of coordination and, and cooperation within uh, this uh, region, which shouldn't be a, a line of division. Uh, uh, rather, I think it should be a, a huge area of cooperation. Patrick, my final question to you relates to the India-EU partnership. You mentioned about trilateral or triangular cooperation. Uh, I want to take that up, particularly in the sectoral areas of trade, climate, and technology in the coming years. So, do you view this partnership growing stronger, or do you feel it, you know, it might get stuck at bureaucratic lines, especially on the sustainability narrative, as they are about to enter the decade of action? You know, we're already into uh, this agenda 2030. First of all, I think those. Again, enormous potential for cooperation in term, in area of development partnerships between the European Union and India. Uh, I still don't understand why this kind of cooperation uh, didn't take place uh, in the past. Yeah, for me, it is just very low hanging fruit to start some trilateral projects, for example, in, in third country, like can it be Myanmar or maybe Afghanistan? Yeah, we have been present in, Af in Afghanistan for last 20 years, both European Union and India. And we didn't actually uh, uh, do much together. Uh, we were working parallelly for the same aim, but parallelly, not uh, jointly to, to achieve a uh, common aim. But now I think at least for, for two reasons, I think uh, things might change. First of all, uh, we need to see this in the context of growing uh, cooperation between European Union and India. There is a lot of going on, on between this, these two partners. Uh, we are getting closer and closer with every passing month, I, I, I hope. So there is uh, more understanding and, and uh, we are just more ready 
possibly to 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 cooperate yeah and secondly i think the the asia or indo pacific will just uh, need more uh, in, in engagement from from countries uh, or partners like india and and the european union because the needs are huge and and uh, pressure is is huge and, and and situation in many countries is getting only worse like let's have a look at afghanistan now, afghanistan will possibly needs more engagement from regional players like india and from from external powers like the european union so uh, to to match, match the needs on the ground in asia or in indo pacific uh, this region will, will just need more engagement from, from partners like European Union and India. So the needs uh, will create also an opportunities for, for cooperation. And I hope it will be uh, grasped by, by uh, the leaders in, in Europe and, and India. It was a pleasure talking to you, Patrick, today. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on developing partnerships. This is all we have today in today's episode. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much.